This evening, I'm going to talk to you about the biblical roots of the priesthood and the Eucharist. I entitle that, The Blood That Saves. Tomorrow, I'm going to do three talks. One is what Catholics believe about the Eucharist and priesthood, just basic beliefs. We can all use a refresher course. You, by the way, you better know this stuff cold. <laughs> and I mean that. I'll tell you why. Do you know why our country is in a mess? I'll tell you why. Because our church is in a mess. That's why. Can I say it any more clearly than that? That's why. The world is in a mess because the church is in a mess. We have been asleep, not all of us, but many of us. And the resonant symphony of truth has not rung out as it should from the rooftops. Consequently, we have chaos in the world. The biblical roots, the biblical background, the Eucharist and the priesthood, it's kind of interesting. Have you heard the word typology before? You know what that is, biblical typology? It's very, very important. In this presentation, we shall make use of what is called typology. The Catechism of the Catholic Church defines typology as the discernment of persons, events, or things in the Old Testament which prefigured and thus served as a type or prototype for things which are completed or accomplished or fulfilled in the New Testament. The typology of the Old Testament is made clear in the New Testament. And what it does is it demonstrates the dynamic unity of the divine plan of salvation. There is only one word of God, one eternal word, expressed in the Old Testament, expressed in the New Testament, but one word an integrity, a very, very strict unity. Paragraph 128 of the Catechism says that the Church, as early as apostolic times and then constantly in her tradition, has illuminated the unity of the divine plan in the two Testaments through typology, which, dis which discerns in God's works of the Old Covenant prefigurations of what he accomplished in the fullness of time in the person of his incarnate son. I once got in trouble, can you imagine that, <laughs> by making a rather crude statement, which I am a master of, in case you didn't know that. I said that no rabbi or Protestant minister could possibly teach scripture in a Catholic university. And part of the reason is, unless you're teaching a language like Hebrew, you can certainly do that. A rabbi can do that very well, but he can't teach scripture. Why? Because he doesn't know the New Testament. And you cannot teach Old Testament unless you are very familiar with New Testament. For the Old Testament must be taught in the light of the New Testament. You cannot interpret sacred scripture, sacred scripture anywhere, Old Covenant, New Covenant, at all, unless you interpret it in the light of sacred tradition, which they don't have. And you cannot interpret sacred scripture unless you apply the analogy of the faith, which they do not acknowledge. I just gave you two of the three uh, principles you need for the interpretation of sacred scripture. The first is you must read it as a totality, and that's what we're talking about here, typology. It's a totality. The old covenant, the new covenant is one word of God. Let me read to you from the book of Genesis, chapter 14, 
verse uh, 18 and following. I forgot my glasses, so I'm squinting here. I'm getting old. <laughs> Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. Now, please note what Melchizedek brought out here. Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. And being a priest of God most high, he blessed Abram, Abram with these words. Blessed be Abram by God most high, the creator of heaven and earth. And blessed be God most high, who delivered your foes into your hand. Now what did Melchizedek, a priest of God most high, bring out? to offer bread and wine. Now that's an example of this typology that I mentioned. That's a biblical type. We talk about type and antitype. Now I'm not going to try to give you a, a lecture really in scripture per se here, but some of these principles uh, are, are very important that you know them. Bread and wine, a priest. Who offered the bread and wine? A priest, Melchizedek, a priest forever. This year, my mother, oh, it was right, after, right around Lent, after Lent, my mother sent me a newspaper clipping from my home diocese newspaper, the diocesan newspaper. And the headline on that newspaper clipping, which, by the way, I looked at it and I, it was splattered with tears, my mother's tears. The headline read, Six priests removed from ministry forever. And the word that leapt out at me was forever. Forever. Many of us priests remember that word being used on the day of our ordination when we were told that you are a priest forever in the line of Melchizedek. It has been a difficult year, but we'll survive Melchizedek, a type of Christ, the priest. In Malachi, we have a reference also to the priesthood. More than one, where Scripture talks about the Old Covenant priesthood or the sacrifices of the, of the Old uh, Covenant being now done away with. The impurity of the sacrifices. And how the priest has to be pure in order to be pleasing in the sight of God. Two things about offering the sacrifice and about the truth. True doctrine was in his mouth. They're talking about the priest here. This is Malachi chapter 2, verse 6 and following. True doctrine was in his mouth, and no dishonesty was found upon his lips. He walked with me in integrity and uprightness and turned many away from evil. For the lips of the priest are to keep knowledge and instruction is to be sought from his mouth because he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. But you have turned aside from the way and have caused many to falter by your instruction. You have made void the covenant of Levi, says the Lord of hosts. Harsh words in the Old Testament. The lips of the priest are to safeguard truth. We have had a veritable catastrophe, an unbelievable catastrophe in the last year, and it was no surprise to many of us. 
I preached all through Lent, as I do every year, and every single place I went, there were a lot of tears flowing. I went to St. Louis, and a priest met me at the airport, and they said, Father, would you address the scandals? There are going to be, there's going to be a large crowd, and many of them are brokenhearted. Could you please address this? I learned a very long time ago, if you deal with a difficult issue, a controverted issue, a painful issue, you are apt to make enemies on the left and on the right. And because of that, many of us don't deal with those things. And the older I get, the more I understand, the more sympathetic I become to it. And to be honest with you, I wish I could get out of it sometimes, but I can't. You have to deal with these things head on. Why is the world in a mess? Because priests are in a mess. Why all the evil? Oh, I'm going, I get right to the point, and I mean it. You may think I'm overdoing it on this. I mean it. As the priests go, so goes the world. <laughs> Jesus Christ gave the church to the world to hold it in being. So long as we are faithful to that mission, we do just that. We hold the very world in being. Another biblical type. The chosen people in the desert. Exodus 17, 8, verse 8 and following. They are about to do battle with Amalek's army, a pagan army. Moses the leader of the chosen people, the visible head of the people of Israel, like any good military commander, goes up on the high ground. And it says that so long as Moses kept his arms outstretched in prayer, the battle went well for Israel. But Moses, being a man, grew weary. His arms began to droop, and then the battle went badly for Israel. Finally, Aaron and another attendant had to prop Moses' arms up so that he could keep his arms outstretched in prayer, whether, we, whether he's tired or not, keep him up there. And Israel won the battle. Now this also is a biblical type for the church. We have grown weary of performing our mission. We have grown weary of virtue. We have become worldly in many cases rather than holy. I remember very well an intervention during the Second Vatican Council, pointed out by the great Archbishop Fulton Sheen. He was there. It was the Bishop of Bruges, Belgium, who stood up and made this intervention. He said, brothers, we are discussing the church and the church being open to the world. Aggiornamento. It is good that we are open to the world. We should open the windows, let the fresh air in. That's good. But I'm telling you, beware. Beware on this point. The world as the theater of redemption is good. 